So my name is Jason Canham. I'm the founder and director of Household Games, which is an indie game developer based out of Toronto, Canada. I personally have been involved in game development for 11 years, and I started Household Games in 2016. Uh, to work on our first title, Way of the Passive Fist. And as well, I am a speedrunner, which is an important point that will be coming up in a few moments. Uh, so yeah, Household Games is based out of Toronto. There are three core members of the team, so the main team is three people. Um, and we develop games for console and PC. And our first title that just came out a couple weeks ago on the PlayStation 4, Xbox One, and on Steam is called Way of the Passive Fist. So the game is designed, uh, it's designed as an old school arcade beat-em-up type game. Uh, it kind of has that 90s cartoon aesthetic, uh, only it involves defensive fighting with carefully timed button presses instead of the traditional button mashing. Now for us, uh, one of the things that was important from the very beginning and what I've been talking the past couple of years about as we developed the game is how important accessibility was to us. And really from the very beginning we thought, what does that mean? What are the goals behind it? And how is that going to affect uh, development? And really the first thing that we wondered when we started making the game was where do we start? And one of the things that we had done even before we got to a prototype was we had a dedicated uh, accessibility expert who was part of the development team. And was really proud to say that that helped us out greatly throughout development. Um, when we showcased the game last year at PAX, uh, a games journalist had written about the game saying it had the most accessibility features of any game they'd seen, which isn't 100% accurate actually. However, it just goes to speak to the impression that we had made, that we were there at a, an event showing off a game that was in the middle of being made and we already had a full suite of accessibility features for the players at PAX. Now why this worked and why this was important, which is the main focus of my talk, is community. We worked with and we collaborated with the community, specifically with very key people and in a few very important ways. And for me, this is important because of gaming communities and subcultures. So I said I was a speedrunner. Well, the accessibility expert that we hired on staff was a Twitch streamer who goes by the handle Half Coordinated, and he is also a speedrunner. So we kind of overlapped in those cultures. And that's how I, I was a fan of him. Uh, I'd watched him for many years. Uh, he plays some of the most difficult games ever made, and he was a world record holder in a few of them, uh, and he can play only with the use of his left hand. Uh, I was really inspired after following him for several years that I wanted to make him a member of the team. And he was giving us accessibility advice even before we had set one line of code and we started working on the game. Um, so reaching out with People like him, uh, he was the first member that we kind of reached out to. We also worked very closely with the Able Gamers Foundation. We worked with them as well. They helped us out a whole lot. Um, and in the first draft of this talk, I was going to go into detail about all the accessibility features and talk about what we had done. Well, I know that out in the lobby, the game is uh, installed on an Xbox. So during lunch, if there's an opportunity, or this evening, would love to like let people try it out and take a look at those features. But I'm not going to concentrate on that right now because there's a much more important point that I really wanted to talk about today which is we had great success and also it benefited our team and made us better developers by reaching out to and talking with accessibility experts but we didn't we didn't get everything perfect and now that we've released the game we've been chatting with people we've been getting a lot of feedback on what we could do better but really the entire point that I spent years talking about, the last two years while we were developing the game, was if everything is front-loaded, if you're planning for everything from the very beginning, the accessibility features are, are givens. They're, they're very easy to implement. We have fully remappable controls, and thanks to the advice of Half Coordinated, we included fully remappable directions. Sorry, fully what now? Remappable. Uh, remappable or resettable or customizable controls. Uh, thanks to those, and thanks to the advice of Half Coordinated, we included things such as completely remappable input directions. So players with non-traditional grips, someone who may hold a controller upside down because that's more comfortable or due to necessity, or someone that uh, needs to hold it perhaps vertically. And any kind of non-traditional grip, uh, the game's fully playable, which is not something we knew about initially. Um, 
And so for the game design, another thing that often comes up with game designers is they wonder, does accessibility affect the core idea of my game? Let's say I would like to make a very difficult game. Will accessibility impact that? And once again, if you think about it from the very beginning, it doesn't at all have to. We created a game that's challenging, that demands certain things of the player, but one of the things that we created was this fully customizable difficulty system. Instead of having easy, medium, and hard settings, we give the player access to different sliders that control the timing of inputs, that control the amount of characters that are on screen at once, and with those variables, they can actually customize the game to be exactly what they want. Now, every player that plays the game has to accomplish the same goal. When we say in this particular level, you have to fight 10 guys and then you have to fight a big guy, every player has to reach that goal. They have to accomplish the same thing. But we allow them to control how they want to take on that challenge. Um, so from speaking with Half Coordinated, who filled us in about players with varying cognitive abilities, we were saying that, okay, so we're saying you have to fight 10 guys, but for some players that can be easily overwhelmed with too much information, we'll allow the guys to come out one at a time and they can focus on them. Now they still have to very carefully perform the right moves, they have to make sure they can beat that opponent, but if they find it much more, they're much more easily able to process one enemy at a time as opposed to a crowd of enemies, they have control over that. So development of all these features went really smoothly, it actually went very well, and I'm proud to say that what we planned for from the very beginning was accomplished on time, was accomplished on budget, on schedule, and uh, it actually worked out quite well. Now I will admittedly say, and kind of this is the topic I want to really talk about today, is what we weren't able to accomplish, and there were a few things. And just like I said, everything is easy to accomplish if you plan up front, the things that you don't become exceedingly difficult. Uh, and we're having some troubles right now, as a matter of fact, that we're exploring. Uh, I will say, well, the first thing is player, non-sighted players was actually something we hadn't uh, accounted for. It was not something we realized. And we're currently in the process of exploring what we can do with that. Uh, it's proving to be a bit of a challenge, but what that's kind of taught me is that we need to reach more people and more developers need to reach out to more people at the beginning of development. Um, hearing uh, earlier today and earlier this week about the Able Gamers player panels, which is a system that they have to get developers in touch with players to be able to get that feedback and learn. Most of the developers that I've spoke to in the last couple years, and once again, this is coming from like the small scale independent developer perspective, is that a lot of developers just aren't aware that there are players in certain segments. A lot of developers just figured that a lot of them consider video games to be a visual medium. So therefore, they don't think that there are players that can approach games in that way. Which has been, very, uh, been a big revelation for myself as well. So it's something we'll take care of in future games, uh, absolutely, and see what we can work with on this title. Now, the main point I want to make today, and the main kind of topic of conversation, is finding ways to get developers more comfortable with reaching out to these experts early on in development. One thing people may not realize is that by the time a developer releases the first trailer for their game or they announce a game, even if they tweet and they say, and here's our trailer, we're developer X and we've made a game about this topic, it could already be too late to make system level changes. By the time they've made the game enough that they've released a trailer, it could be for a small team already too late for them to go back and rewrite their audio engine or change entirely um, base functions. So developers really need to reach out before they start developing or at the various earliest stages. Um, so yeah, getting advice before a prototype happens. It worked really well for us, but I realize now we weren't as exhaustive in our research. We didn't reach entirely the right people. Had we reached out to, or I realized that there were non-sighted players who could play games, then we would have had that from the very beginning. So it's something that we're endeavoring to fix with future titles. But I would encourage all developers to seek out people. And most of them will say, 
When they say, I didn't realize that that was a segment of players, it's really about understanding about how we can spread that message even more. How can we get every developer to know that there are non-sighted players, there are, there are definitely uh, players without hearing, players that have varying control needs, letting every developer know that those players exist, spreading that awareness. Awareness has come a long way, um, but I think until everybody knows that, that they need to cover all those players, there's still a little bit of work to be done, even though there's been a lot that has happened. Um, so in terms of barriers, it's just removing all of the barriers to entry. There should be none. And the fact that there are still some barriers in our game um, means that there's still work to be done. Like I said, the, the initial draft of this talk I was going to give when I initially planned it um, was very much talking about everything we had done. And it was a bit, you know, pat on the back. You just kind of say, like, we had done a lot. But really today, I think it's more important to spread the awareness of what more can be done. Um, so yeah, once again, just kind of reiterating that point that by the time the general public hears that a game even exists, it may be too late. So really having developers reaching out early. And developers need to become more comfortable. Most often developers don't feel like they're comfortable showing the game to anyone until they get it to a certain point. They're like, I want a certain polish level. But sometimes that means you can have certain systems cemented by the time you're ready to do that. And becoming more comfortable with talking to people before it's in that state is really, really important. There are things that can be done post-release. We're in the process right now. We've been communicating with a lot of players, getting a lot of feedback. We're planning for certain things right now. We're trying to see what we can do. Um, it's very, very hard for small independent teams um, patches uh, can be very difficult, um, but like I said, you can remove that entirely from the equation with the early planning stages. So we're seeing what we can do, we're communicating with players, but more importantly, uh, we're absolutely guaranteeing for future games we'll be able to do the most we can. So, and as long as developers are saying that they can keep taking lessons forward, I think that's, that's definitely a positive thing. But don't be afraid to give feedback as well. Developers are welcoming of feedback, always. Uh, positive, constructive as well. It's all very important for developers. And yourself as a developer and myself, I don't mind being upfront and honest with everyone I speak to. I've had several in-depth conversations with players providing feedback, and I've not had a problem just being completely honest and forward with my information, just saying like, hey, here's, here's where we're at. Here's the trouble we're currently having. I'm not sure if we can overcome it with this title. And um, kind of having these conversations have been really important to me. So takeaways from this quick little rapid fire conversation. And like I said, I would like it to start more conversations. I want to hear about developers who have been doing outreach or if you need information from me about who we've spoken with, who I'm continuing to speak with, or if there are other people if there are people who want to get in touch with developers, so people, advocates and experts who are like, I would love to give information, I don't know enough developers. Finding a way to make these connections is really, really important. And being a part of communities, everything comes back to communities. Um, we now feel like we are definitely part of a community. We're working with and within that community and we think it's only gonna benefit things just a ton as we move forward. Uh, so that's that. That's the quick version of that. Thank you very much, everybody.